Hey everybody, it's Paul with Reporting Live from my sofa. How are you? I'm doing pretty good. If you can tell, we are at the old campground, which is now new again because we're back, if that makes sense. It feels like fall outside. I am so excited. I, I cannot tell y'all. The heat has been unbearable. So, also, before we get started... I am going to also, well, we already have one episode of the podcast up about this case, the Todd Mullis case. We're going to be following this daily. I do the podcast with Alan Reese from Toxic Bliss. It's different content that's in here, and we just kind of have a casual type conversation about different aspects of the case. So if you're interested in that, you can find that and more information at the link to my website down below, but I'll also put a direct link to the podcast down there as well. So, that being said, today's video, I am going to be reviewing and making commentary on day one of the Todd Mullis saga. So, without further ado, let's review! Okay, so day one, we have, you know, opening statements, closing statements, or opening statements, closing statements. We have opening statements. Uh, we They went through a lot of witnesses, so I was happy to see it. So let's just start and kind of go down through each thing. So the state gets up there, you know, she goes into, like, the day of the crime. She talks about, she's very detailed about, you know, how Amy would have felt with the rake and piercing her body and uh, all that kind of stuff. And so, you know, it was effective in that way. Um, now, she admits that, you know, yeah, Amy was not happy. She was having an affair. She wanted to leave Todd. This is not a secret. She goes into, and this is like setting the motive up about, you know, how he finds out that she was having another affair because she had two affairs. And, you know, he basically didn't want her to take half the farm. You know, his family were all farmers. He had put his life into it. And essentially, that's where they're going with the motive. Now, the state is saying that he sent Amy to the shed, and we'll hear about this later, uh, as the day goes forward in testimony. And the, the, basically, that's where he attacked her. He killed her. And he tried to make it look like a far, farm accident by, you know, essentially saying that she fell on this corn rake. Uh, but then he sent his 13-year-old son to go find his dead mother. And she goes into the obvious shock about that. So she goes into how he told 911 that she fell on a corn rake. But then she also goes into what's obvious that, you know, from test from evidence that she was struck two times with a corn rake. And there was that. Now, she also sets up the story that we're going to hear that Amy was scared of Todd. And then she also goes into some of the Google searches, which were pretty bizarre, like how to kill unfaithful women and things of this nature. Now, the defense gets up there for their opening statement. And, you know, the defense actually says, hey, we agree with some of what the state says. Because, in all honesty, this is going to be a tricky case for them. So the defense describes the morning. He sets the whole scene up. He describes how Todd and his older son went to go work at basically another site. Uh, they came back. They, they get us to where they're all outside working. He talks about Amy's surgery that she had. Um, how she felt cooped up, so she wanted to come out and do some of the cleaning and working in the light fixtures, things of that nature. He maintains the story, you know, that she wasn't feeling well, she was dizzy, so Todd's like, hey, look, why don't you go back to the house, but on the way, get the pet carrier, set it out by the door if you can, uh, because apparently there was like a litter of kittens, and maybe something happened to the mother, and by them opening and closing a door, they were very nervous about these kittens getting hurt and whatnot. So he wanted Amy to get the pet carrier, leave it out, they would get it, and put the cats in it, I guess. So now Tristan, the, the defense sets this up where Tristan says the only time he was out of his father's sight was when he briefly went to a room to basically get a drink of water a couple of times. And that's going to become an issue later, which we'll get to. Uh, now after about, they continue working and after about an hour, they go somewhere to essentially where they would see this pet carrier, but it's not there. And that's when Todd says, hey, go, you know, go find the pet carrier, go, you know, go to the shed, whatever, you know, what's up with it? So the son goes, he finds his mother, he yells for dad, Todd goes, he's sees Amy on the ground with the corn rake sticking out of her back and you know they go through the process of you know, getting out of the truck call 911 911 meets them or you know the ambulance people whatever about halfway in the road they try to resuscitate her they get her to the hospital she's pronounced dead Tristan is taken back to the farm and he shows some deputies like the area that happened kind of walks them through it then Tristan's taken to the hospital where he does some more or answers more questions about the situation now this is where the defense starts kind of setting this narrative up where they're basically like you know Todd didn't know what happened so he just basically assumed that she fell on this fork 
uh, on the um, I keep calling it a fork, but the uh, the corn rake, the corn fork, whatever they call it, they kind of call it a few different things. So they're setting this up like I mean, and that would be a logical explanation if that tr legit happened that way. Of uh, well, I mean, that must be what happened. But and also they're like, you know, she had all these layers of clothing on, so he was not able to see. Oh, well, wait, you know, she's been hit twice with this thing. So they're kind of playing it off like he just came and stumbled upon this accident. So that's the defense's way of saying, look, he wasn't lying about that, that he just didn't know any other thing. That was the only explanation in his world. Now, the defense also admits about the affairs and how, you know, Todd learned about these affairs. And, you know, but he says that they were working through it, that Todd always strived to maintain the relationship and that they had kind of worked through their issues. Now, the name Jerry Frazier is brought up, and that is one of these people, one of the guys that she was having uh, this situation with. And he, apparently he, like, worked on the farm on a regular basis, and so Todd, you know, went through some phone bills and basically finds evidence there of their correspondence. He confronts the guy, he confronts the guy's wife, you know, but nothing really comes of that. Now, all during this kind of stuff, Amy's, like, you know, definitely out there with she doesn't want to be with him, she wants a divorce, so on and so forth, she wants to be with Jerry, so that's not looking good so then the defense talks about these internet searches and basically the defense is trying to set up in my opinion that you know look here's all this technology but other people had access to this technology it wasn't just him because you know if you can prove that but again it's kind of like well that's a major coincidence and then the defense is basically like you know yeah you know we're not trying to say that this was an accident or whatever yes she was murdered yeah but there's plenty of reasonable doubt here that, you know, my client did this. So they're going to have to offer up something to say, well, here's the other person that did it. Because without that, it's like, yeah. You know, the only other person would really be the son. So next, Amy's brother, Jeff, gets up on the stand and, you know, basically talks about how this farm is family property. It's where they grew up. And then he goes into, like, a story where basically they were having some family issues with a grandparent in the hospital. And that, that was one of the situations where... Amy had told him that she wanted to leave Todd, but that he would flip out. Uh, she said that she wanted to divorce him. And also remember Jeff, the brother, was holding furniture for Amy. So he was working with her on a departure. I mean, it was that for real in their world. And, you know, also, so here's evidence coming out of, yes, yeah, she was scared of him, so on and so forth. Now, also, it comes out during this testimony that Amy had had an argument with her mother-in-law, essentially over this mother saying, oh, Amy's, you know, leaving the, leaving the property and being away from the kids and abandoning the kids and all this kind of stuff. Well, then the defense gets up there and it's kind of like, you know, well, did you know that, you know, the mother-in-law stuck up for Amy during that decision? And, you know, uh, he doesn't know that. And, you know, they really don't go over too much with this guy. I mean, there just wasn't too much. You know, they established that he did not know about the affair that she was having. So, you know, there's that. Next is Eileen Fuller. She gets up there. And this is a friend of Amy she met in 2002. Uh, she actually met her current husband through Amy. And about two and a half years after the first affair, Eileen said that Todd and her had a private conversation. And that he was like, you know, you know what Amy did? And she was like, yes. And he was like... She was like, you know, it looks like you're working things out. And he said, well, I have to. I don't want to lose the farm. And again, this kind of testimony is just helping set up that motive. Now they go into, you know, in 2018, all these issues Amy was having. She lost her grandmother. Uh, you know, uncle had an aneurysm. So there was like all this, you know trauma going on in her life. Now, during this time, she would constantly be at the hospital, and so evidence was brought up about how, you know, Todd would always text her. He was expressing concerns, like, to the friend here, uh, to Eileen, about, you know, a Amy's always gone. She's spending so much time at the hospital. And during this time, he basically expressed to her his concern that she was having another affair. And, uh, you know, with the field manager, this guy, whoever was, like, working and coming to the farm. And he talked to her about, you know, how he confronted her. And Eileen's like, you know, uh, first of all, Eileen didn't know the guy, but she was like, look, you just need to talk to people about this. You know, Amy, the, the wife, and all this kind of stuff. But she doesn't really know if that ever took place. Again, the claim is brought up that Todd claims he confronted his mother about the... the squabble between those two but nobody there doesn't seem to be any proof of that and i guess they're trying to show that he stuck up for her i don't know what the point of that is now what i consider to be the big bam you know holy mcmoley hold your britches 
testimony for the day was Tristan the Sun. So for me, you know, going into this, because remember, the sun basically can be his alibi. You know, and a lot of it depends on that. We already know that he had like this, you know, we grew closer because we both knew about the affair. So there's this kind of odd, you know, uh, crossing the line type father-son relationship on the father's part. So the son testified basically from Skype from another room, so he's not in the same room. And so we don't see him or whatever. And he gets up there and a lot of interesting things come out during his testimony. So we find out that, you know, he's living with his grandmother and his uh, step-grandfather basically now. Yeah, you know, they go over some stuff, but they get to the day that Amy died. Now, the, she, the, the state establishes that nobody else was working on the farm that day. She wants to make sure, you know, that it's just y'all there. Now, they get, they walk us through all the stuff we've already heard about, you know, they go out and start working. The mom's out there doing stuff. She seems dizzy. Hey, why don't you go rest, but get the pet carrier, you know, and like, if you're able to, to move it, great. If not, just put it over in this area. I'll get it later. Now, this, the testimony thing gets into, you know, did you lose sight of your dad? Yes. For how long? I don't know. Did you see your mom then? No. And she's like, was there anything around you to tell time? You know, a watch, a phone, anything? She's very, the state is very big on making sure that that's covered. Then the state starts saying, you know, well, last week during a deposition while you're under oath and yada, 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 you know, you testified that you were gone for about one minute, 40 seconds. You know, and she confirms, but now you're changing your mind. And he's like, yeah. Now, they walk him through the same chain of events about, you know, uh, uh, the dad doesn't see the pet carrier. Son, go grab the pet carrier. And him go and seeing his mother. You know, she was not responsive. I checked her pulse. I checked her breathing. He calls his father. They call 911. They get in the truck. Uh, they put it in their truck. They start moving. Now, the, the mother's body is on his lap. Can you imagine how traumatic that is. I mean, first of all, you, you're already gone and found your mother in the state. Secondly, they put the body over his lap. I mean, maybe it was the only thing to do. I don't know. But I'm just like that poor kid. Now, he continues to walk us through all the same stuff that we've heard. You know, the 911 call. They meet them on the road. They take the mother. They go to the hospital. Now, remember, he goes back to the house. Like, essentially, it sounds like some friends of his drove by the scene. And then they took him back to the house. The deputies there, they go over that. Like, what happened? Now, they bring up again, like, you know, with these the meeting with the police. And now he said that he was with his dad the whole time. And there's a few more interviews, like various different times and stuff like that. And they're basically bringing up how each of these, he was like, no, I was with my dad the whole time, but now he says he wasn't. Now, the state also establishes that Tristan never slept in his room. He slept basically, like, on a sofa in the living room. And his dad also slept, like, it sounds like a recliner or something like that. He had back problems. So, you know, they're kind of, A, showing us that, no, they didn't, the parents, Amy and, uh, Todd did not sleep in the same room. And B, you know, the son, they weren't like sleeping, you know, in the same bed together. You know, but they were in the same vicinity. So it's, it's showing us more of that closeness. Now, also, they go through establishing all the technology uh, that the family members had, where it was kept. He said that he used his dad's iPad. He knew the password. And then she's like, but last week in the deposition, you said you never used it. And he acknowledges that. He also acknowledges that, yeah, he knew about his mother's affair. And he kind of talks about the story where he came home from high school one day. His mom was upset. And later, you know, his dad had this conversation with it about it so on and so forth now the state goes into you know basically establishing has your family told you what to say about this you know no they haven't you know it establishes that his attorney told him not to talk to anybody once that attorney was hired and then she point blank asks him did you hurt his mother and he says no now y'all next the defense gets up there and I'm not trying to isolate anyone here in this situation because the state did it too but it was just extra extra with the defense the defense is essentially showing pictures now now, first of all, let's stop for a second. I was watching this last night after moving for the third time in two weeks. Thank you, Hurricane Dorian. But I'm thankful to be here. I'm watching this speed it up. And I mean, almost like what, like times 1.75. So I'm watching it fast forwarding. When the defense gets up there, I'm like, why? What are these long pauses for? What is he doing? So a huge amount of time with the defense in him is the defense entering evidence and showing photographs. Well, apparently they had to go show them to each jury each time. And I was like, oh my God. I mean, it, y'all, I was just like, I'm going to fall asleep sitting right here. I was so tired. But... Yeah, you know, they're going over the stuff, and I'm just like, oh my gosh. So if you're watching it in real time, I was like, this had to have taken forever. I mean, the video is like two hours long for just that. So, but all these pictures are essentially just establishing the buildings, the layouts, the views, things of this nature. Because again, hearing it, you're kind of like, okay, well, how did you see the pet carrier? Were you able to see this? Because a huge thing is, well, the, if the son was there with him, 
then this can answer our questions. You know, did you see your father disappear long enough to kill your mother? So, you know, they do establish that, yes, twice I went to go get a drink of water. And, you know, this time the defense is trying to establish a story, but because it's like you do a picture and then you wait what seems like five minutes, it, it's very, it gets very much like, you know, wait, what were we doing? Wait, hold on, what were we going? It could, it probably was just me all. So, but I mean, again, as much as I'm like, yeah, that testimony was great for him. It just, it dragged on. Even the father looked like he was falling asleep, y'all. I mean, he was just like looking at the glass of water, like, please keep me awake. Please keep me awake. So, so, you know, the defense also goes into about his story being changed and all that. And he also goes into, well, did you see your dad distraught where it was blood on him or his clothes torn? You know, basically something that would look like, did a fight take place? You know, does your dad look like that? And he says, no. And the defense just goes back into these conversations about him knowing the affair and his dad having these talks with him about about, you know, your mother's acting weird and suspicious and all this type stuff. So, you know, I really felt like his testimony. What's weird to me about it is even if Tristan's like, okay, well, I was gone for a minute and 30 seconds. And we're getting ready to go into the medical examiner. So what the medical examiner is showing, I'm just like, yeah, that's like a beating, you know? So, and we don't, and we haven't gotten to other testimony too, but seeing the layout, seeing all this type of stuff, I'm like, okay, if Tristan is telling the truth, because he has changed his story now, I don't see how the father would have time to go do that. But I also just don't think it went down really that way. Um, and I'm not trying to say that Tristan's lying or that whatever, but something just doesn't add up yet. But again, we don't have all the testimony yet, so there's those dots haven't been connected. So the state crosses him again, and they're basically like, you know, going through some of these views, like, this is your view. Would you have seen this? Would you have not have seen this? And a big thing for the recross crossing, whatever you want to call it, is the state's like, you know, do you want to be here testifying? No. Do you want to see something bad happen to your dad? No. So the state's kind of trying to make it like, you know, mm, this is not too much of a reliable witness. And since he has changed his story, once I get more information on that from other testimony, I just don't know how to feel about it. So then we hear the 911 call, and as usual, y'all, these, th these recordings are always so difficult to hear. I mean, there's so much background noise and this and that. Yeah, do, do I think he sounded like, oh my gosh? No. You know, do I, do people react differently in trauma? Yes. So, I mean, that part, I'm just kind of like, I can't really say anything about it. It's online. Check it out if you want to hear it. Put some headphones on and just really try and listen to it. You know, if anything, he does sound a little bit more on the shh side. But again, people react so differently. I just, I never really hold that against anybody. Now they go and they interview a couple of deputies before they get to the medical examiner. And, and basically some of the, the interesting things that came out of this were they were establishing being a number one eyewitness to the bruising and stuff like that that they saw on the victim once they arrived on scene. Cause like one of them was the person who showed up and, uh, and met them on the road and, you know, helped that transition. And so he talks about, you know, uh, trying to trying to help Amy out, you know, seeing these bruises like on her jaw and stuff like that. Uh, so then the next detective that gets up there, uh, the biggest thing with him is he's talking about the murder weapon and he has the corn rake and he opens it in the big evidence bag. And it's just always so, when they pull that stuff out, I'm always just like, Ugh. you know, especially something like so you know, sinister looking as that. I'll never look at a, a corn rake again the same. Not that I will probably ever see one. But, you know, they leave it up on the stand, they keep panning to it and showing it to you, and you're just like, oh my God, that's the thing that by hook or crook some way, you know, this has killed this woman. And so it's just always kind of creeps me out. Now the medical examiner gets up there. They end the day with this. You know, it goes on for a hot minute, but not too long. And basically, you know, they're going over things and he's talking about these different things of the different wounds. You know, for example, that there's some uh, wounds to the chin, around the ear, uh, abrasions in the left hand, on knuckles, you know, bruises on the jawline. So on the arm, things of this nature. So there's all these, you know, it, it, they make it sound like, oh, there was just this, you know, I fell on a, a corn rake and it killed me. But there's all these other injuries to her. You know, and essentially he, you know, he does talk about the puncture wounds at one point. It essentially, like with the other wounds and stuff, he's, you know, going into the science of those. But he's like, well, this isn't really consistent with the fall because there's no gravel, there's no dirt, you know, and these scrapes. Like these are things you expect to see if somebody, if she had fallen down onto the floor and gotten hit by this. Well, not only that, but, you know, all these other secondary injuries. So he says that these wounds are not consistent with 
falling down. And so basically what then throws that off is he's like, the story I'm being told does not match the wounds I'm seeing. These are not consistent. So the body's sent to a forensic pathologist to dig a little deeper into the case. And he says that because he doesn't have the straight story that he couldn't determine the cause of death at the time. Now once the defense is up there, he establishes, you know, that blunt force trauma caused the wound to the neck. You know, at one point the defense, you know, he's trying to walk the medical examiner into saying, well, I don't know what angle those the wounds from the uh the corn rake came from you know he's like i'm pretty sure but that's why it's also with the pathologist so we'll let them make the final call but you know it's it's looking this way so you know it's very interesting and so hearing that because to me when you hear the aspect of well one wound goes this way one wound goes the other way i mean come on so i you know i thought it was an interesting day overall we're gonna kind of wind this down here um, you know, I'm glad we got to hear from the son on the first day. I hope this trial doesn't take too long. It, there's a little bit of like a dryness to both the attorneys in it. Uh, and so it's just kind of, you know, one of those where I'm like, okay, let's, let's get some juicy parts going here. Um, but, you know, hopefully justice will come to the surface in this. I have a feeling it will. I mean, you know, I'm innocent until proven guilty. Uh, but there's some things that are just kind of like, it's not a good look. So... Um, anyways, we're gonna wrap this up. It's becoming a long video. Thank you for hanging out with me. Again, be sure to check out the podcast as well as subscribe to this if you want to see my other updates coming. We're gonna be following it every day. I appreciate you taking the time to hang out with me, and I will see you later.